Welcome to my review of Philip K. Dick's Ubik. This book was published in 1969 and in the same year that Slaughterhouse-Five didn't win the Hugo or Nebula Award, Ubik wasn't even nominated for either, to the immortal shame of both those organisations. This book, written on the cusp of the 1970s, takes place in the then future, now past, of 1992. The plot follows Joe Chip, who works for an anti-psychic organisation whose job it is to stop criminal psychics from stealing personal data, corporate information and predicting the future to their own ends. Basically all the stuff currently being blamed on Russian hackers. When Chip and Co are suckered by a rival firm with the help of a couple of insiders, his boss is killed. Later, as the survivors begin to die in mysterious ways and reality itself seems to be unravelling, Chip looks for an answer that may or may not lie in the strange substance called Ubik. If I may quote from the renowned literary critic Kevin Keegan, this is a book of two halves. The first, while setting up the environs and characters, is full of biting satire on the over-commercialization in the world. Everything in Chip's apartment is coin-operated, and as Chip is frequently broke and doesn't have any coins, his appliances berate him for this. While this is entertaining, it does set up Chip as somewhat weak, which makes the idea he inherits his boss's role on the event of his incapacitation a touch surprising. To that point, he'd seem to fit more in the role slash cliche of the technophile that cannot get his life in order. It was a bit out of the blue that his boss respected him when his toaster doesn't. Respecting him personally, that is, rather than just for his technical abilities, which, in the circumstances presented, seemed unlikely. The coin operating appliances are a really interesting concept. I can see a future economic model in this. Appliances of this sort must be reaching a point where the cost of making it and shipping it around the world is not worth incurring given the tiny retail prices they command. So why not license a product rather than sell it? The Acme Toaster comes with a 10 slice license. Renew your license online before April 1st and get two free slices. Chip's ongoing battles with his 10 cents ago front door are one of the highlights of the book in the early stages. It's almost a shame they disappear from the novel as the mysterious goings on regress Chip and Co's surroundings back into the past. By the second half, when things get a little bit strange, time appears to be jumping backwards for Chip, causing his milk and cigarettes to go rapidly off. Despite dispensing with the wry humour, the second half of Uric is not in any way weaker. Instead, it's tense and mysterious and becomes an effective thriller. The scene where Chip is literally dragging himself to his demise is incredibly powerful, a fantastic piece of writing for an author whose quality of prose is often questioned. The ending is open to interpretation and does leave a lot of the fans of the book disappointed. If you'd rather skip this section of the review and potential spoilers, you should move the slider to the time shown on the screen. The recently dead, or nearly dead, in Ubik can be preserved in a kind of cryogenic cold store called Cold Pack or Half-Life, where they can be periodically thawed for a chat or to help with important strategic decisions. Chip's boss, Runsica, sends him messages suggesting that Chip and the others are in fact in Cold Pack and are under attack. Only Ubik can protect them. The final chapter repeats a lot of these messages, only with Runsicker and Chip's positions reversed. It's a great ambiguous finish to the book. Postmodernist novels of this type are often much more interested in posing questions and offering answers, so you'll find a lot of literary criticism on them, and some on this book individually. Readers are invited to question the book and the reality around them. The answer to Chip's degeneration turns out to be Ubik, a substance advertised in a myriad of forms at the top of each chapter. These adverts nearly always imply the threat that, despite Despite its miracle properties, improper use of Ubik invites disaster. Ubik is a contraction of ubiquitous. It is, as you'd expect, everywhere. Yet to Chip it remains fleeting, resisting his attempts to obtain it. This everywhere at once, difficult to obtain panacea, naturally invites comparisons with God, or at least faith and religion. The repeated use of use only as directed hints at the horrors blind faith has wrought on mankind, supposedly in the name of its saviours. Ubik, like religion apparently, is only good in small doses. So who survived the bomb? Chip and Co or Runciter? Well, the book doesn't provide a clear answer. You can take the ending as Runciter having invaded Chip's experience in Cold Pack, or you can see it the other way around. It appears to me, at least, that both are in the same state. The novel makes it clear that they are not both in the same location, questioning if Runciter survived or the others. However, it is also possible to see this as one being in Cold Pack and not the other, but ultimately both being in the same condition, that of being dead or dying. The merits and morality of Cold Pack are questioned by most of the lead characters at some point, as Chip's battles with his doors and appliances also shows, technology in Ubik is not seen as an enabler, but as a hindrance. 
Chip muses that Ubik was sent by God to help. Who then sent Jory or those like him? There are Jories in every moratorium feeding on half-lifers. Who pays Jory's bills? Cold pack can be seen as contradicting the natural order. Chip and Runciter both muse on this. Could it not actually be Jory, despite his malevolence, who is restoring the natural order and therefore doing God's work? I have a Christian I have a Christian centric view of this, of course. Dick explicitly links this to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. More familiarity with that may lead to a different interpretation, but that's the point of the ending, to draw your own conclusions. The debate and discussion it provokes is part of what makes Ubik such a great book, but it couldn't do it if it wasn't a well-written book as well. Welcome back. Somewhere on this channel I reviewed The Man in the High Castle and talked about how it never quite reached the standards I expected from such a renowned author. Well, Ubik delivered, and it delivered in spades. This book is exceptional. As such, I highly recommend it, particularly to sci-fi fans, especially fans of Vonnegut, see my review on Slaughterhouse 5, or to anyone wondering where to start with Dick's mighty back catalogue. Damn it, Seagull, put your thumbs up. Thank you for listening to me prattle on. Feel free to comment, sub, ding, like or not. YouTube gives you all of these options out of the goodness of their heart, so you may as well click on something down there.